All right. I would love to. First, I want to uh, take the opportunity to thank all of you. Dan has thanked you. And, you know, we come and we see everything that you're doing, uh, both beforehand, behind the scenes, and during the conference. And it's just a great encouragement to us to see how this congregation pitches in together uh, so that we can have this time of fellowship. And so uh, my wife and I thank all of you as well for doing it, for hosting us. Uh, we're very selfish about this. Um, I'll probably go into deep, uh, unmitigated grief if we ever stop having me come. So I'm, you know, just, uh, no, it's, it's just wonderful for us. But it's also built really wonderful relationships um, between the congregation and many of you uh, for and with the seminary. And that also means a great deal to us. We know that you're praying for us regularly. Many of you give to us. Some give to us very generously. Others, we know, give sacrificially. The church gives to us the offering at the conference. Um, and that is very important as well. And then we do want to be accountable then to the churches. One of the, I think, things that I constantly stress is that we don't think we know better than the church. This is why we have sessions that are in sponsoring relationship that we seek counsel from and listen to and presbyteries. Um, and so we need the church. We need the wisdom of the church and we need the prayers of the church and we need the support of the church. Uh, we are a non-aligned reform seminary um, and that means that we don't have any denomination behind us. Um, <clears throat> But more importantly, the, from the financial angle, we are a very inexpensive seminary. Our tuition is two-thirds, three-fourths less than the other main Presbyterian seminaries. Uh, kind of the rule of thumb is, and I've seen this in print in a number of places, so I know it's accurate, that um, college, universities, graduate school seminaries... <laughs> get about 70% of their income from tuition and fees. And 30 from donors. And we have reversed that. We get um, uh, less than 30% of our income from our students. Because we don't want men leaving seminary with a burden of debt. That, though, means that we are very dependent upon individuals and churches for our financial viability. And at the end of the day, very dependent upon the Lord to provide for us through uh, those uh, agencies. The uh, fiscal year, which goes July through June, started off very dangerously. Uh, and part of that was because of some decisions we had to make the year before to spend some bequest money that I would never do, but we had the financial commitments. We had not done a good job of raising the money that we needed, and so we did that, which then simply postponed everything hey, one year. And some of you know, because you got phone calls from me um, in August or September, that we were really at crunch time, but God blessed that immensely, and that just changed the whole course, and some of you here tonight had an important role in that, and so we actually are having now a very good financial year. We had an, a very good December. We will be doing a, uh, a new fundraiser, a selected, I don't know exactly how it will be uh, aimed, not to everybody, uh, around graduation. And then we'll do our June year-end uh, appeal. And so we're hoping by God's grace that we're going to finish this year uh, way ahead of budget. <clears throat> Whatever I budget for the next year in income, I don't budget over what we have received in the previous year. But I want to stop even doing that. I want to be able to budget under what we perceive the previous year so we can maintain a very good uh, contingency fund. We would like it to be two to three hundred thousand dollars. Then we don't have the uh, pressures that come in the uh, slow times. And uh, so um, 
we're praying and seeking that we're going to end this year. We still have, we now just started going into the contingency fund. It was 100,000, now I think it's down to 70. Um, so uh, that's where we are in terms of finances. Where we are structurally is, is exciting uh, with Dr. McGraw and Dr. Morales, which is why we had the initial a bit of financial uh, difficulty, have been a fantastic additions to the faculty, not only in terms of their scholarship, but their piety, their family life, their hospitality. Um, Brenda is still talking about Dr. Morales' message at the conference. You'll have Dr. McGraw here uh, in October, and uh, you'll, you'll see for yourself how blessed we are. We also, uh, the board made a decision uh, that we did not renew the contract of uh, Mr. Mose, who had been very faithful for seven years uh, as Director of Development and Recruiting. Um, but the board needed, wanted to go a bit of a different direction with the kind of person that was there uh, and the gift set and skills. And so in God's providence, and it's again a wonderful providence because I have begun the process of looking for somebody for this position, one of our students called me who just really wanted to move to Greenville because once a student does, a distance student comes on campus, he just really wants to move down permanently. So I'm talking to him and I'm saying, well, tell me, you know, I need a resume. Here's some of kind of the jobs that, that are available for students, but tell me what you do. Oh, I'm a development director <laughs> for a Christian organization. I said, well, I might, I might have something in that area. Send me your resume. So he did that. Eventually, the decision was made to make a shift. I talked to about six people whose names I'd been given by various board members or whatever. And uh, everyone was a dead end. And all that was left was Zach. Um, it's just the Lord's way uh, of bringing him to us. And he already he started in January. Uh, is doing a fantastic job. Just, he stays on top of things for one thing. So, for example, somebody wrote my wife about how to access these sermons, somebody in California. Zach, who's peeping over her shoulder on Facebook, immediately sends the young lady the link. Now, why he's doing that today, I don't know. But anyway, he's just, you know how young people are. I think that Facebook their phones just attached to their ear or something. And isn't that right, Andrew, that uh, it's just uh, alter ego? <laughs> Good for you. So anyway, um, no, he's on the phone. He's uh, contacting people. He's writing letters. Um, yeah. So, Zach, I'm talking about you. You should be in church. <laughs> Don't look at that phone while you're in church. <laughs> so um, uh, that's been a great blessing, and we think it's really going to be, um, and in recruiting. Again, he's young. Uh, he's very committed and zealous for the things that we're, for which we're committed at the seminary, and just really connecting with prospective students. And um, that's been good. And between the various contacts that I've had and he's had in particular, uh, we might be looking at our largest uh, intake ever. Now, I pray every year for 25 new students. Actually, this is bucking the trends. The, the national trend is in seminaries, conservative and liberal, is about a 10% decrease in enrollment. We experienced that this past year along with the other conservative seminaries probably much worse in the liberal seminaries. But um, we could be bucking that uh, and have our largest intake, maybe over 20. Um, so you can pray about that as well. Pray that Donald Jackson will get his head together and start studying online, move this man forward before he's too gray to become a pastor. <laughs> so we have about 60 students uh, the first semester, and, and for the first time we had almost a Half of those students in the distance program. Um, we, in January, a number of new students came in. And one of the remarkable things was I really thought that our tuition income was going to even be 
below. <clears throat> Again, I have difficulty there budgeting that because you have students that drop out for a semester. We have, oh, the other thing I'm on the money, we have waiver students. And so if the student comes from a church that is a supporting church, the student comes tuition free. So he has, pays his fees and that's all. Uh, and then he works four hours a week on campus uh, to uh, help us uh, do the things that we can't afford to pay somebody to do. But actually, in tuition income this year, we are ahead of what I budgeted as well. So God has been very gracious to us. And if we get the large enrollment, that does help with our income. As I said, it's only 30%, but if you're not making the 30%, uh, of what you need, then it does create problems. So all around, and we're very excited. We have more requests for, for pastors and for interns than we can begin to fill. Most of our seniors already are committed to, to different things this, this next year. And um, we thank God for that, but that's why we plead with God and pray with us that God will send us these students to, to, to prepare. Um, one other thing you can pray about and, and uh, many of you, like my wife and me, are of an age that you can plan about, and that is we're trying to build up our uh, deferred giving through um, charitable trust and bequest. Hope that you'll put the seminary in your will uh, and other types of uh, trust and whatever. And we do, it, we're going to be sending out letters, but we have got access to a number of different types of people that do this, that are volunteering to help uh, people that want help in that area. Uh, and so we can uh, direct you if you don't have your own uh, charitable type advisor that you, that you want to use. So thank you very much. Any uh, follow-up questions on that before we get to the other things? I'm way ahead of schedule. I'm not supposed to start this until 7.30. I'll try to make sure. We need that floating microphone. But anyway, you know, it's my responsibility, and I am going to be faithful. But I remember to take the safety off. So the seminary, do all of our graduates go to Reformed churches, or we have some that come from broader background? We, uh, most of our students are either from the OPC or the PCA. We do occasionally have students from the Dutch Reformed churches, and from we get a few from the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church. We have had, over the years, some very fine Calvinistic Baptist students who are serving uh, congregations. In fact, uh, Jeff Duncan is over on the coast from here, and uh, one of our graduates doing a very good job planning the Calvinistic Baptist Church. What, in Alamar? What, what, Swanson? Swansboro. Uh, <clears throat> and then occasionally we'll get someone who comes in that doesn't really know what we're about. And for the most part, these men uh, change. A really great story is uh, uh, Isaac Melvin. Isaac and now is in the OPC. He came, he's an Indian. He came to us uh, with not much grasp of, of Reformed theology. He became Calvinist and soteriology. He then became Covenantal. And now he is a candidate in the OPC and uh, ho hoping to, to get an internship. In fact, if you need somebody over here, he's looking for an internship. Um, and he's just a remarkable, a remarkable story of how he has grown in a, in, in a lot of his classroom. But, you, you know, you, you kind of reach a section. It's been his interaction with his fellow students. It's really God used in a really wonderful way to help him uh, in, in this process. So we see those things uh, happen as well. I also should have mentioned our international students. I, I know that the Campbells had had some questions about that as well. I think that we've got students, alumni, serving in 16 different countries in addition to America. Um, uh, many nationals, some few uh, American missionaries. Uh, and 
we, over the years, have had a lot of international students. It had been down a bit, but this fall, and that, uh, that amazing enrollment is not going to make a lot of money for us because we have uh, three or, we've got one delightful couple now from Brazil. We've not had couples in a few years. We've got at least three couples coming from Brazil. Um, we got another student trying to come from Uganda, and I forget, there's two or three other, I think, foreign students that are seeking to come to the seminary this fall. Now, what we do for students that come from third world countries, if they come with an endorsement from people that we trust, then we will provide not only their tuition, but we will provide as best we can, their living expenses as well while they're at the seminary. And we do a special fundraiser for that uh, in the summer uh, with each student's profile, what we think it's going to cost the year to have them. And that fundraiser also has within it uh, foreign travel. So when I go to uh, Italy or uh, Nigeria, for example, uh, that is paid for by the mission travel account, uh, which enables me and others to uh, take trips like that as well to serve the church. It's hard to go to Italy, but uh, somebody has to do it, you know. <laughs> I do work hard when I'm in Italy. Um, so uh, that mission approach to get these students in that, that we can uh, get them trained. If you really think about it, for missions-minded churches, you you know, it's, it's over $100,000 to put an American couple on a foreign field per year. They start out not knowing the language and not much about the culture. For $100,000, you can get a man through Greenville Seminary in four years and send him back to his country, a Reformed pastor. Now, I still want our guys to go out as missionaries, but I want them to go out with their classmates that will take them and help them be really effective then as they go to, uh, to their own countries. So it's really uh, great that we are able to do this with, our, uh, with, with international students. The difficulties with respect to subscription, where do we see ourselves in the next uh, 10 years? <coughs> well, uh, background, as, as Ash spoke some yesterday about the subscription issue, uh, there's two basic approaches to subscription. Uh, there is what we would call full subscription or strict subscription, and there is kind of a system subscription. System subscription person says, well, I believe the general doctrines of the confession of faith, but there's a lot of gaps. And in the PCA, the Presbyteries uh, have supposedly the right to make decisions of what are important gaps and what are not important gaps, but the Presbyteries vary. The OPC has a fiction that they have no exceptions, um, and that is a fiction. Uh, they simply don't declare exceptions, <laughs> but uh, there are men that also would have exceptions in the OPC. I will say the OPC, I think, does a much better job confessionally at this point uh, than the PCA does. Uh, we at Greenville Seminary are adherents of full subscription. And that means that we, as a faculty and a board, hold individually to every single doctrine in the confession of faith and take an annual vow unto that end. Now, when we say that, we're not saying that the Confession of Faith is infallible. Um, there'll be exegetical differences. And so we allow scruples. So we'll take a couple of examples. Dr. Knight, who would actually has written on full subscription, uh, is a premillennialist, which means that he uh, cannot hold to the catechism uh, description of a single resurrection. But his press trade knows that. He believes in the second coming of Christ. He believes in the final resurrection and the judgment. And he would hold that scruple. Or 
um, we hold the regular principle of worship, and, and we believe that we may only sing what God reveals to us to sing. Now, if the confession says that we should only sing songs from the Psalter, I scruple that. There's actually a historical question about that. Uh, were they requiring exclusive use of the Psalter or requiring the singing of the Psalms? Um, but exegetically, I would say, I think that we should sing hymns as well as Psalms. But that's not an exception to the standards because we hold to that we may only sing that which the Bible reveals. So that would be the difference. So, next 10 years, I don't see any problem for us. Uh, I'm an optimist, though, so. Um, only because of the fact that, I don't know ecclesiastically what the landscape will be in the next 10 years, but what I have seen is, in my own denomination, because of some of the radical things being done by the non-subscriptionists, the middle of the church has definitely made a move toward Greenville Seminary. I'll give you an example. We have two men that just were examined about a year and a half, two years ago, over in a presbytery in Alabama. A presbytery that's not been anything. It's, it's a good, solid presbytery, but it's not been in the uh, uh, sphere of, of influence of, of, of Greenville Seminary. The first man, when he was uh, being interviewed, there were people concerned that he was a Greenville graduate. So he called me, what do I do? I said, you just tell the session what you believe. And if they want you, they'll stand behind you. And if they don't like what you believe, then it's good they know right now. Well, the church called him. Then there was a church in Brent, Alabama, and they wanted a Greenville guy. And so they're talking to me, and I give them a name. And then these two guys were examined at the same Presbyterian meeting. And a man that I've known throughout the history of the PCA, so that's whatever that is now, 73, uh, what, 30, 40, 44 years, um, called me. He said, Joey, we just had two of the best press tree exams that we've ever had. Would you send us more men? So that's the kind of thing, I mean, our graduates are our best advertisement. And that's the kind of thing that happens. So um, at this point, as I say, we're getting more requests than we have men for. Now, you know, we can't compete with a seminary that is putting all kinds of progressives into the denomination. But we don't need to. Uh, we need to do, be faithful at what we do. My motto is one church at a time, one day at a time is how reform comes. And so I don't know where the denomination will be my denomination will be in 10 years. Um, but there will be either a revamped reformed denomination um, of some sort. I'm completely opposed to another uh, new denomination. So there's going to be a revamped reformed denomination um, made up of men who hold our view of subscription. And um, there'll be plenty of place for us then, I think. I might change the subject. No, I did not say that. I said I do not. He asked if I said the PCA was going to split. Mark what I said. I don't know where we'll be 10 years from now. But wherever we are, there will still be a revamped, reformed confessional denomination. Yeah. <laughs> You've been making eyes at me all night. Yeah. Uh-huh. Questions about the conference? Messages? Or anything else? I, I like question and answer times. So if, we're lived, if we are to live to the glory of God, how can the church rationalize accommodating worship to the unbeliever? Well, the church has lost that motivation and, uh, of living with the glory of God, and the, the motivation that has replaced it is we will use whatever means 
necessary to try to reach the lost. Now, it's, it's foolish to accommodate yourself to the world, to reach the world with the gospel, but that's the driving motive. So if a church really is motivated to honor God in worship, the only way it's going to know how to do that is to worship in the way that God has revealed that he wants to be worshipped. And so our services should be filled with scripture. As my friends say that we uh, pray scripture, we read scripture, we uh, sing scripture, we preach scripture, we experience scripture in the sacraments. You fill your service with scripture, you're filling your service with God, and you're having communion with God. So no, I think that really, is, it really boils down to the motivation. And if you want to glorify God, you're going to want to worship God according to his revelation. You know, this, uh, there's so many ways this, this spills over. We just had a a friend, in fact, she's been over here to the conference with us, I think. Has Wendy been to one of the conferences? Yeah, Wendy Morris. And she's been looking for a new church home, and she was in a PCA church, and she was about to join that church. And she talked to the pastor, and he said, you know, we, we, don't, you know, we don't emphasize the Sabbath. We don't emphasize gender issues and stuff like that because we don't want to drive off the people we want to reach. That's a big thing up there in that big church in New York. Uh, and they've said it quite clearly, you know what I'm saying? We don't speak out against homosexuality because we want to reach the homosexuals. You know, it's a shame that nobody told the Apostle Paul that. He loved to reach the lost, but he was quite clear of applying the law of God. Ash would not do me a favor if I went to him, I asked him a question yesterday, should I do something? And he well, you don't need to do that. No, you tell me what I should do. And um, that's what you expect your doctor to do. You don't expect him to sugarcoat it. And we have to be compassionate, loving, and winsome, but we must preach the whole counsel of God. If you love the lost, you love the glory of God, you're going to use God's method to reach the lost and not accommodation. Accommodation is going to, is going to be a very big problem, I think, in our, our churches. It's spreading from worship now to other things. You're all worn out except Mark. So how do you get the people, that, what do you all call them, the fringe, uh, involved uh, in the life of the church? Uh, you, when they come in, they need to understand the expectations of the elders. This church would be larger if the elders did not have biblical expectations of people coming in. Uh, but once you start compromising at that stage, it still doesn't guarantee that people are involved in all the activities of the life of the church, but at least the entrance has been clear. Then there must be pastoral care. Uh, one of the heartbreaks in our Reformed churches is the failure of pastoral visitation. And uh, <coughs> so the elders and the pastor need to be in the homes of people, and those who are being negligent about evening worship or prayer meeting or the Sabbath need to be regularly encouraged that um, these are things that are for your well-being, and you know, we really want you to do these things. And then the elders in particular praying regularly in intercessory prayer for all of the members of the congregation, and then in preaching the whole counsel of God to be willing to apply the word, again, not just to get on an individual, but um, 
classes of people that would be negligent in this thing or, or that thing. And to also preach the word in such a way that we recognize from the scripture there are hypocrites in the church. That's why you often hear me address unconverted people uh, when I preach. Uh, because I know simply from the Bible and realism that there are uh, people in the church who have made professions of faith, who outwardly appear to be uh, just hunky-dory, and they're not converted. So those are some of the things, I think, that, that we should be doing. Okay. Donald. Good. I'll try to summarize this in terms of because of the great diversity of theological belief and practice in many of the uh, southern black churches. Uh, how does a, um, a man who is uh, committed to the Reformed faith um, exercise influence and leadership and prepare himself to serve in uh, that context? As I said today, I think one of the first things to do is to quit looking at the big and focus on the individuals. Plug into one or two men. that You can take that discipleship material and meet with them and begin to take them through the biblical doctrines and the practices that you love. Um, it might be a pastor, it might be a former classmate, might be a man simply in the church, 
look for look for the spiritual minded ones. I know that again, at least my experience has been. You're right; it's more women that would be spiritually minded than the men. But there are going to be spiritually minded men. Look for someone you can plug into. Second, um, you might best serve the Lord in uh, simply a church that's not a black church, but a church that. Um, is broadly ethnic and racial, uh, which is increasingly happening in, in our Reformed community with uh, churches that are uh, very multi-ethnic. And uh, that, you know, I, mean, I would love to see you go back to uh, your community, but I don't see any real biblical basis for starting a white Presbyterian church or an African-American Presbyterian church. I see starting Presbyterian churches that we will be intentional. Now, a white church needs to be intentional. And I, I think I've shared here before, there's the a PCA church in Douglasville. I was their pulpit supply for about 10 months. Love that church. And... Uh, because of where they're located, they've had a number of African-American families visit. And the elders seek them out. And they say, now we know that what we're doing is different from what you're used to, but give us a few weeks. We want you to be here. And they probably have the largest percentage of, of the really strong Reformed Presbyterian churches of an African-American membership. Of, um, of the churches where I have been. So we have to be intentional uh, on our side, uh, not only to welcome, but to help transition them. Say, so give us time. We want to explain to you why we do what we do. It's not a matter of culture. Um, uh, we, we, you know, give us opportunity and, and love them and then show that hospitality uh, to them. And see that if, if we can't see the churches that are truly going to be uh, multiracial and multi-ethnic. Now we're up against a new problem. And that is something that I just got exposed to a week ago. It explains a lot of things that I couldn't understand about racial reconciliation. And this is what is called critical racial theory. And critical racial theory uh, is saying we, color, being colorblind is not good. You see, what I've just described, they don't want because they believe that we have white privilege and what we as white people have to do is uh, recognize white privilege and in whatever way you do that, get rid of it and lift up then um, black, they use the language black and browns uh, into these positions. Uh, the little bit that I've read is completely contrary to what our Savior teaches or what the Apostle uh, teaches. I think that we bring our cultures and we revel in our culture as much as good uh, in your African-American culture in terms of commitment to family and uh, uh, caring for uh, one another and just uh, uh, joy. And, um, and, and you don't quit being... African American or white because you're in the church, um, we can revel in, and enjoy each other's cultures. Uh, at the same time, recognize that the church is bigger than any one culture, and we're not going to accommodate to cultures. We're going to try to accommodate to Scripture. We want to be a scriptural church, <clears throat> and then recognize that you are going to be a, a, a as you said, a double minority. Um, you're, you're a minority in a, in a white reform circle and you're a minority in your black culture as well. And, but again, God in his providence has brought you where he's brought you through those men in your life early on. And uh, as I've said to you before, I think you can play a very important role in advancing what we want to advance. And that is to have, I mean, I long to have... Uh, the spread of the Reformed gospel in the African-American community. Uh, 
And so, yeah, I don't think we pray and strategize. And, and, you know, you've asked me, but you're also, in another context, we can sit and talk. You're going to have ideas, and we have to listen to each other as well. Ben. Say again. Hmm. Uh, um, are you talking about political, militarily? Doctrine of non-resistance is the question, Ash. Appreciate that. I'm being faithful. I turned the safety off. So, um, yeah, the brown. Yeah. So, uh, I, I think that in, in reforms, if I understand the question, in reform circles, uh, Calvin's answer was that the lesser magistrate may lead uh, in uh, rebellion against a higher magistrate if there are biblical uh, issues. Uh, Knox and the French Huguenots uh, were a bit more aggressive in their uh, response to uh, physical resistance to tyranny. And so the Huguenots uh, took up weapons um, against the tyranny of, of the French, and they died by the sword. Um, I like Calvin's position. I think we could exercise it a lot more fruitfully. For example, <clears throat> let's say you have a, a Christian who wants to run for the mayor of New Bern, and and he puts together a group of people for the city council. They say, if we're elected, there'll be no, we'll close down every abortion clinic in New Bern. And there's the lesser magistrate saying, no, uh, we're not going to have a, and there are cities that are doing that, you know, around the nation. Um, different ways to do it, make the qualifications so stringent that uh, a thing couldn't afford to open or whatever. So um, now if somebody, in persecution, um, if it's a, if it's an official state persecution, that brings up a whole other issue. Seems that we either flee or suffer, like Zaki did. If it's an individual uh, terrorist type persecution, then I think the uh, sixth commandment teaches me the responsibility uh, to defend myself. I, I have a biblical responsibility. Uh, if I can, to defend myself and particularly to defend uh, my, my wife. Uh, and so uh, we do believe in armed resistance. If somebody breaks into my house, I think I have a biblical responsibility to give them a warning if there's an opportunity to do that, but I'll shoot them. And again, the Bible is quite clear. Now, if they're walking away from my house, I may not shoot them. See, again, the Bible answers these things. So it says, the person's breaking in, you don't know his intention, and you may kill him. If he has taken your property and he's leaving, then his intention is not to do you harm, and you don't kill him. And so I think that these are things, I, I know John Piper has uh, uh, really come down hard on uh, armed resistance and Christians' um, carrying weapons and stuff like that. But I found his remarks to be very unbiblical, particularly in terms of the Bible's requirement to defend life. Gather this came out of another conversation already. <laughs> it was funny, I went the other day, should have known by the name of the place, it was the Southern Eye Clinic. And I got in there and I developed an eye problem on my trip. And they, actually, it was triage. They said, I got to come in immediately. So they're doing all this paperwork. And she said, I need your driver's license to get your picture. Looked at my wallet, and I realized I hadn't transferred my driver's license from my travel wallet. I just got home. So I said, you know, all I have is a picture on my uh, uh, carry permit. She said, oh, that's good. We like to carry around here. <laughs> That's not going out on the air, is it? <laughs> See, I tell my students when they edit stuff. I used to, um, we used to have a system where we actually had a, 
the microphone, so if I, I take it outside in the hall, close the door. <laughs> but that's out live. We can't even edit that. So anyway, I think that was all right. Everybody, you know, we carry it to seminary because uh, I think that seminaries like us will be a place that will be uh, easily attacked and churches. It's interesting that where we go to church uh, for the sake of, I, I won't put that on the air, but uh, initially when they talked to their insurance carrier about concealed weapon, they said, no, they called them back. And they said, yes, we want your deacons to carry. And I can go to church on any, any Sunday and, and give a hug to one of my deacons and uh, I'll feel that gun on his waist. <laughs> I mean, there have been a lot of life spirit of churches uh, and schools and there's Texas schools now that have just passed legislation to allow students and teachers to carry as well. So, uh, Crazy people aren't dumb. And they know uh, where they can go. And so I, that's why I think that Christians and Christian institutions have every... Now, we have it's a very careful responsibility. You have to fill out a form, um, submit to the particular rules, show me your, your license, and sign the form with the rules. And so it's not just that you know, anybody can. Now, I was, and I haven't quite had the nerve yet, that in North Carolina, it's open carry, and I almost got my nerve to get out of the car with my gun on my waist and go into the fast food place, because I saw a man do it, you know. But uh, uh, they said, yeah, it's open carry now in North Carolina. Hard to get a gun, but if you got it, it's... <laughs> oh, well, a bit off the subject. Mark. Ah. So is it biblical that uh, we have a political policy that uh, is pro-Israel because we believe uh, that God's going to do work with Jews? No. Didn't say he's going to do work with Jerusalem. Um, that's a dispensational thing. The temple's not going to be rebuilt, I can promise you. If it got rebuilt, it'd be apostasy that rebuilds it. But there'd be no biblical temple uh, rebuilt. And the nation of Israel, because what you're hearing is this is God's people. No, they're not God's people in that regard. The church is Israel. Now, they're going to be brought back in. So ethnically, they're still a people. And uh, the motivation that comes out of that is aggressive evangelism to the Jews. So groups like... Uh, witness to Israel and, and other groups uh, like that. But the foreign policy is this is a special people in a special land, and thus we have to... Uh, uh, no, I'm, I happen to think that it's the most democratic state in the Middle East. There are a lot of Arab citizens in Israel that you don't hear about in the press. Um, but... Uh, I, so as an American citizen, I be, want to protect them because I think they're a buffer uh, and they are a fairly democratic country, but not for any religious reasons. Ben? I think the Roman Catholic Church is an apostate body. Now, when I say that, that doesn't mean they're not Christians in the Roman Catholic Church. There are Christians in the Roman Catholic Church, in spite of the church. But itself is an apostate body. That's why at the seminary and the missions that we're doing, for example, in Italy, we do not accept Roman Catholic baptism because we think it does not meet the requirements of Scripture or confession. Okay. All right, so the Apostles' Creed says Holy Catholic Church, but it doesn't say Roman Catholic Church. So, I, I did say it, didn't I? You want me to repeat something I didn't repeat? 
Yeah, the small c. My tutor's back there now. So, um, so that um, it's a very, Catholic means universal. And so, for example, in Confession of Faith 25.2, it says it's the visible church is also universal. And uh, as such, we believe that every true church uh, is a part of the, the body of Christ, part of the visible church, and all true converted people in it are part of the invisible church as well. So it's good that periodically we explain that. That's also why, on the other hand, you'll never hear me talk about the Catholic Church and be referring to the Roman Catholic Church. You see, they usurped the word Catholic, and they claimed to be the universal true church, with the Pope as the head. So I'll always talk about Roman Catholic Church, and if I'm really in a foul mood, I'll talk about Papist. But... Uh, you see the difference? Good. The old confession does consider the Roman Catholic Church the Antichrist. Exegetically, uh, that is problematic to say it is the Antichrist or the Pope is the Antichrist, but I think that popes are Antichrist. And I think in getting rid of exegetically, uh, probably not the best language, we've lost the strong stance in the confession of faith against Romanism. Uh, so any man who puts himself as the vicar of Christ's church is obviously an antichrist. But we know from 1 John that there are many antichrists. Now, what most people mean by the antichrist is the man of sin and lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Could that be a future pope? It could be. Because I think it's going to be a religious figure. People want to make Obama. No, I don't think it's a political figure. I think it's a religious figure that is going to put himself on the throne of God. Uh, now, the pope meets a lot of those requirements, but not the whole eschatological flow, in time flow, of 2 Thessalonians uh, 2. Uh, I'd say the present pope is clearly an antichrist. Well, I don't know a pope that hasn't been an antichrist, um, at least since the later part of the 6th century. I'm not sure that Gregory the Great was an antichrist, uh, but he sure moved things in the wrong direction in terms of the centralization of, of authority and power. All right, I think it's the bewitching hour. Thumbs up, huh? You got anything to say or do? More food? You didn't say go back and eat, though. So that's... <laughs> Remember to get your books quickly so that uh, Stan and I can get those books packed up and so I can go home quickly and eat. But again, we love you all so much. And it's just so refreshing. Uh, as I've said many times, it's, it's the highlight, one of the highlights of my year to come over here and uh, be with you. And to see God keep adding uh, more people to the congregation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, uh, a frank discussion that we can have. And, and we thank you that um, uh, we can search your word for answers. Uh, we pray you'll give us continued insight, illumination by your spirit in scripture. And that we will seek to govern every part of our lives individually, familiarly, and in the church by your word. And dependence upon Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so bless the people now, Lord, as we go our separate ways. Those who will be traveling either tonight or tomorrow, that you'll keep us safe on the road as well. We ask these things for Christ's sake. Amen.